Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. The program is Focal Point, the network AFR Talk. You know, I give Jeff a hard time about his golf game, about uh, swinging titanium clubs out in the rocks. I'll tell you, the only reason I know that he's out there doing that because I'm out there with him. So just to be clear on that. And Jeff did tell me on the break, hey, if you uh, hear a fire truck, you hear the fire truck sirens going through town, you just say to yourself, hey, Jeff must be on his way to the golf course, must have a tee time. All right, well, let's go to our decision-maker line. I'm honored and pleased to welcome to our decision-maker line Matt Staver. Matt is the vice president of Liberty University and the dean of the Liberty University School of Law. Matt, welcome back to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Thank you. My pleasure to be with you, Brian. Uh, Matt, uh, I, I want to talk about this Justina Pelletier uh, case to begin with, and if we have time, I might like to get your observations about what happened with the Hobby Lobby uh, case, but I want to talk about Justina Pelletier first. And, Matt, you have been representing the Justina Pelletier family in court there in Massachusetts. And just for those that we've talked about this frequently on this program, but just for those in our listening audience that may not be familiar with the backstory here, catch us up to speed. How did this story begin? What is going on and where are we at today? Well, Brian, uh, Liberty Council got involved in this case about a month ago, maybe five weeks ago now, when we heard about this on national news. And it was after Lou Pelletier, the father, uh, spoke about his daughter's situation that had been going on for then 13, now 14 months. Uh, And 14 months ago, in February of 2013, uh, let's back up to January of 2013. January of 2013, Justina, 14 at the time, was involved in figure skating competitions. Then in January, January toward the end in February, she began to get the flu. She developed a gastroenterology type of symptoms, couldn't eat very well. She was treating with a doctor at Tufts who was the chief of pediatrics at Tufts Medical Center. So it's not a shoddy hospital, and he was the number one person in the pediatrics division who was a treating physician for some time for mitochondrial disease. He recommended that the family take uh, Justina to Boston Children's Hospital where she would see Dr. Flores, a specialist in gastroenterology, whom she had seen before at Tufts, but who now is at Boston Children's. So following the doctor's medical advice, they took their daughter to the hospital, and uh, a rookie doctor, seven months out of medical school, saw her, decided he disagreed with the diagnosis, didn't talk to the treating physician, and said, no, it's not a physical mitochondrial disease problem, it's mental, it's psychological, it's somatoform disorder, and consequently put a new treatment plan in front of the family and said, this is what uh, you need to do. They said, where's Dr. Flores that we wanted to come and see? We're not going to bring him in. This is the new treatment plan. Sign it. One-page document. We're going to discontinue all the medical, discontinue the vitamin regimen, no medications. You can't get a second opinion, and you can't even speak about medical conditions in the presence of your daughter. Sign this. This is the new treatment plan. It's going to be all psychological. They said, uh, no thanks. We'd like to discharge her. We want to go back to Tufts, treating physician at the pediatric center. And uh, that's when they called in DCF, the Department of Children and Families. And DCF never visited the parents' home, never did an inspection, never spoke to the three older daughters, never spoke to the private school or anybody else, just interceded and prevented the family from taking the daughter home, and that was 14 months ago. So we've got a, a, a girl who's 15 now, and when this whole nightmare started, she was involved in figure skating competitions. Now she's confined to a wheelchair. And, That's right. And, and, and what I heard you say, Matt, is that the, the, the medical regime that the parents were following for Justina was the regime that was provided by one of the top pediatric specialists in the country at Tufts Medical Center. So it wasn't like they were following. They wanted to go back to some kind of bizarre voodoo-type no. medical care. They wanted to go back to the regime that had been working for their daughter under the, under the guidance of one of the top specialists in the country and the Department of Children and Families in Massachusetts wouldn't let them do it. I mean, to me, Matt, this sounds, right. this sounds like a kidnapping to me. Well, in fact, that's what they alleged. They called 911 and they said, uh, Boston Children's is kidnapping our daughter. And so the policeman came and uh, DCF showed up and the police said, well, 
uh, DCF is asserting jurisdiction, we can't do anything. And so DCF asserted jurisdiction, and uh, they prevented the family from taking their daughter home. Now, it gets worse. That was 14 months ago. So the discontinued medical care, this girl hasn't had education for now 14 months, so now she's lost at least two academic years of her career. She hasn't been able to communicate with her best friends at the private school she was in. She hasn't been able to see her 92-year-old grandmother. The parents can only get one hour a week supervised visitation with a DCF worker. They can't take photographs of her, although they have recently uh, snuck some cell phones in to take photographs of the daughter's deteriorating condition. And it shows that she's losing her hair in multiple spots. She's got swelling. She's uh, She's in a wheelchair. She can't walk. Her speech is starting to get slurred because she's not getting hmm. any of the medical treatment that was keeping her well and continuing to allow her to engage in figure stating competition. Even though she had the mitochondrial disease, she was operating and functioning, going to school. Now she has none of that, so she has gone backwards, and she is now in a very serious situation. And and I think what, what's, what, what kind of compounds the tragedy, Matt, is that a judge issued a ruling this week. You've gone to court to try to liberate this girl from, from, from liberate her as a hostage. She's been taken hostage by this government agency. You went before a judge to try to get her set free, get her emancipated from this kind of bondage, this kind of slavery. And what, and, and what did the judge do? Well, the judge did two things. Liberty Council was asked about four or five weeks ago to come into this case and to uh, represent the family. So four days after we came into the case, we asked the judge to have a special admission because this is a Massachusetts case. I litigate all over the country. We have a local council, and uh, he moved my admission. Four days after we came in, but before the judge ruled on my admission, uh, DCF backed away on some of its situations. In fact, DCF even agreed to enter into an order that we prepared allowing her to go back to Tufts, which she wanted to do 13, 14 months ago. But then this week, the judge uh, ruled on two things. Number one, on my admission. He says, no, you don't need to be admitted. I know you're an expert in constitutional law, but that's not necessary here. So he's not allowing the family to have the attorney of their choice. Hmm. Uh, We're going to appeal and get outside of this judge. In 27 years of litigation, I've never had any Hmm. court anywhere deny my admission to any case in Hmm. any part of the country, state or federal. Hmm. And so the second thing he did was he issued the first written ruling he'd ever done in 14 months. Not a single written ruling had he done before. Hmm. And it's a simple four-page ruling. And he tries to justify the fact that DCS is involved in the case because, well, when she was at Boston Children's Hospital, the family uh, called them Nazis. Well, yeah, after they took the girl and they wouldn't let her go, anybody would call them Nazis. Is that a reason to take the child? No. And what's the reason that they have the child? Give me the facts. Not a single in piece of information is in that order justifying DCS involvement. This is a situation, pure and simple. Because when we looked at this originally, Brian, we had the same reaction most people had. There's got to be something else going on. I mean, certainly this can't really be happening. And we looked at every angle, and certainly, unfortunately, this is what's going on. Mm. You know, family Matt, follows the medical advice of their doctors, and they get their daughter taken away because another doctor disagrees. You know, you, Matt, you will read stories in the newspaper about families say that withhold medical treatment from a child. Maybe they don't believe in vaccinations yeah. or they don't believe in uh, medications, and they just want to heal the child through prayer, so they make a deliberate decision to withhold medical care from a child. But but that's not a factor here because they were following no. the best medical regimen in the country. And and this that's state true. agency steps in and stops them. It takes their child away. And, and there are rare cases where you have maybe a family that over-medicalizes and, and gives treatment and maybe even invasive uh, treatment that the child doesn't need or even on themselves. Well, the problem is, if that were the case here, even though they're following the expert of a top pediatrician in a top hospital, if that were the case here, she would improve when she's not with the parents. Mm -hmm. But for 14 months now, she's gone downhill, progressively getting worse, and her condition continues to deteriorate. And here's how vindictive DCF is. Last week, DCF on Tuesday said, we understand that you took photographs of your daughter last week. 
okay, you're not going to get have the one hour visitation uh. this week. Well, and you know, and, also, and, uh, you know, and you wonder, Matt. I wanted you to finish that thought, but you wonder if the reason they don't want cell phones in there is they don't want the family to be able to document the physical deterioration okay. of their daughter. Brian, you're exactly right. What conceivable reason would they want to prevent the family from taking a photograph of the daughter when they celebrate Christmas, when they have a birthday party? Wouldn't you want to have periodic? photographs? Wouldn't you want to be able to take these back to your grandma, your 92-year-old grandmother, and show how she's doing? What conceivable reason? What conceivable reason would DCF have for not giving this girl education? And what conceivable reason would they have for telling the family, which they've done uh, for 14 months until now we're getting on the case and we're going to force it, that you can't have any clergy? No pastor can come and visit you. Hmm. Now, uh, I understand that the, there's not another court date, there's not another hearing scheduled until almost two months from now, so this thing is going to stay kind of in cryogenic form, frozen as it is, for at least two more months? Well, not really. Uh, I mean, that's what the judge said. You can come back maybe in June, but we're going to go to the appellate level mm. right now. We're not going to have another Groundhog Day. We're mm. going to go back and take this to other avenues. All right, well, thank you, Matt, for taking time with us. I've been talking with uh, Matt Staver, Vice President of Liberty University and Dean of the Liberty University School of Law, head of Liberty Council, one of the finest First Amendment law firms in the country. So, Matt, really appreciate you taking time to be with us, and, and God bless you, and may God liberate Justina Peltier from this thank kidnapping. You, All right, Matt, thank you very much. Matt Staver, Liberty University, Liberty University School of Law. We'll be right back with... More after the news. Stay with us. Focal Point AFR Talk.